Well, hey everyone, uh, super glad that everyone could make it, especially Corey, I'm super excited to meet him. Um, big thanks to the North Face and Whole Earth for making this happen. Um, look, I, my name's Emery, I'm a, a manager of one of the Whole Earth stores, um, long distance hiker, through hiker, all that kind of backpacking, backcountry stuff. Um, Whole Earth Provision Company uh, is a, a local store in Houston, Texas. We've been open since 1970. We're still family owned. Um, we're in Austin, Houston, Dallas, and San Antonio. Uh, you know, our store's concept was based on the Whole Earth catalog that was this like cool counterculture publication from the 60s that had access to tools and independent living. And now you can find everything from like homesteading tools, solar power stuff, um, technical equipment, eco-friendly clothing, yoga stuff, frisbees, kites, anything to get people outside. So um, yeah, it's a really great place to be uh, to work and uh, and I get to be a part of things like this. So it's it's really, really neat. Um, you can find more at our website at wholeearthprovision.com. Um, like I said, my name's Emery Cookston um, and we are glad to have Corey Woltering here. Um, Corey is a runner of all stripes um, and, and is known and we're here to talk about him being an ultra runner which is just um, he's been making big waves in the scene and has a lot of really cool stories and so hopefully we'll get to hear some of them today. Um, Corey did you want to add anything to that? No I mean that sounds good thanks for the introduction. <laughs> <laughs> well we're really really happy to have you you know we uh, um uh i've been reading about you all week so i gotta admit i have been kind of geeking out um you know as i was reading about you you are um uh, i was just really impressed that you know you you started running it seems at a young age you ran in school and then in college and then your kind of journey to where you're at now um has been pretty neat to read about um what what made you fall in love with running and kind of what brought you to ultra running specifically oh boy ultra running <laughs> um yeah so this is actually kind of funny um but my first race was against my grandfather when i was seven years old um and they lived across the street from a church so i thought i'd race them across the church parking lot because, you know, I thought I was the fastest kid. Well, uh, my grandfather actually beat me across the parking lot. So I turned around and said, hey, we have to go back. And I beat him on the way back. So technically, I'd say my first race was a tie. Um, but that's kind of how I started, like, racing, I guess. Um, and then it was, like, fifth and sixth grade track meets and then junior high and high school and college. Um, and I was doing stuff like 200 meters, 400 meters, 800 meters, um, and really enjoyed all of that. Uh, wasn't really a fan of, say, like cross country because it's like we were running on grass and I didn't know if it was going to be, you know, an exact three miles or if it was going to be a little under, a little over. So it's, uh, it's, I look back on that and I just kind of laugh now. Um, but yeah, so anyway, uh, I was also a swimmer and a soccer player growing up. And I got injured quite a bit through my late stages of high school and early college. So with a swim background and a run background, I figured, hey, I should probably buy a bike and I can get into triathlon. I mean, seemed like a logical progression, you know? Of course. Uh, yeah. And so um, I actually qualified for the Half Ironman World Championships twice. Um, while I was in college, uh, which is funny because I was still racing, you know, the 200, the 400, the 800 on the track, um, and then was racing cross country for the school in the fall. Um, so after college, I'm like, oh, I want to become a professional triathlete. So I moved from Illinois to Boulder, Colorado, and tried to make it work. Um, but ended up hanging out with a bunch of trail runners, um, and quickly realized that, you know, I loved the trail more than I loved, um, you know, just being on, you know, the road all the time and swimming in a pool and all that stuff. I just loved how trail running was, uh, less structured, I guess. Um, so yeah, and now here we are like seven years later or whatever, which is, uh, so wild. <laughs> That sounds like a wild journey, man. Um, you know, I, I was reading about when your time in Boulder, 
And, you know, uh, there was some stuff I read that, you know, that you know, there were some uh, uh, struggles with like um, the difference in running at such like a high elevation and, you know, just the challenges and struggles that that brings, you know, when you're out, uh, I don't know. I mean, look, we're not all doing this professionally, but on your hard days, um, how do you keep motivated to, to keep up? I mean, especially from moving from sport to sport, um, what motivates you to keep doing that? Yeah, um, that was actually quite the, quite the journey in Boulder, uh, going from Illinois to Boulder. Well, actually I went to Estes Park for so like 7,500 feet mm -hmm. um, and then down to Boulder at about 5,000 feet. Um, and I was pacing a friend at the Leadville 100 and that, that was like my first introduction to like trail racing. And so I loved that so much that I actually moved up to Leadville for about a year. Um, and that's at 10,200 feet. So um, I think that by living in Leadville, like that was kind of the, um, like you just have to be tough to live in Leadville because it <laughs> snows, I mean, it snows like 50 weeks of the year up there. It's at 10,200 feet. It's, uh, it's not warm. And so because of that, uh, that's one thing, just like the toughness I developed from being up there. Um, and now it's, I, on the days that I'm not super motivated, I still get out of the door and go do these things because it's like, I want to be able to have these experiences of, you know, the different trails I've been doing and the different races. Um, and so you just, you have to do that. And it's not necessarily that you have to put in an epic training cycle every single day or every single, you know, six weeks doesn't have to be epic. It's more just about being consistent and getting out of the door, even if it is for 30 minutes, because 30 minutes is still better than nothing. And I mean, if you can just commit to, you know, 30 minutes a day, uh, you can build a really solid base on that. Wow. That's, I mean, that's so true, you know, and, and building a routine is just, you know, so helpful towards like staying structured and staying out there. Um, you know, <laughs> that's crazy talking about Leadville and, and like toughening you up. I was also reading, cause you're from Illinois and, yes. and you know, oh, I'm sorry, my puppy dog's in the room with me. Um, but you're from Illinois and, you know, of course, trail running and whatnot, like, sure. We think of places like Colorado and, you know, like mountain states. Um, but you've got you've got pretty varying temperatures there too I mean you've got hot summers like you know in the 90s and then you know you get down to like cold winters and stuff like that um do you think that also helped set you up for success or is there anything specific about you know growing up and starting out there that you think really impacted you in the running world yeah absolutely um it's kind of interesting. So there are a lot of the top ultra runners right now that actually grew up in the Midwest, whether it is Michigan, Wisconsin, Illinois, uh, Minnesota, that now have moved out West just because they prefer, you know, the, the more stable weather, I guess. Um, because like, here in Illinois, uh, we had, like, I went to a high school that didn't have an indoor track, and then I ran for a college that didn't have an indoor track. So we were outside for all of our workouts throughout the winter, um, you know, all of our speed work, all that stuff we were doing it. I mean, there's, I mean, I've run in 20 below uh, zero, like here in Illinois, um, which is colder than I even ran in Leadville. Um, and then it's just, it's so wild, but I think that because I did that for so long, that kind of set me up to kind of develop that toughness. You know, so, I mean, of course there's like that physical toughness and stuff like that and the, the mental toughness that you bring with it. But I mean, when you're running in those kinds of crazy weathers, do you, do you have a pretty like varied sort of like, uh, uh gear set and loadout that you have for the different weather or, you know, on those cold days, are you just fueling up and staying warm with kinetic energy or are you just you know bundled up with earmuffs and stuff and also running you know yeah um I'm not as familiar with the cold <laughs> sure um I have many memories of just being in college and not knowing like 
anything about layering and all of that. So like we'd be out there in like our running tights and like a running jacket, but then we'd also have like our big puffy jackets out there on the track with us and like blankets. And we'd just like throw that around us as we're standing on the track between intervals. And then it's like, oh, now it's time to go again. You just throw it all off and run and then you'd keep on doing that cycle. Um, whereas now, um, especially now that I run for the North Face, it's like I have gear for literally every condition out there. Um, like from stuff that, I mean, people used going to like Everest to, you know, uh, summer gear. So that's awesome. But I definitely think that layering is super important, especially for this cold stuff. Oh yeah, for sure. Um, I mean, yeah, it, that's, Having a good gear selection definitely helps. Um, but not everybody can get there, but we can't all work for the North Face or Whole Earth. Uh, so it's good to know that you can make do without it. Um, you know, kind of shifting gears, you know, you've, you've run a lot of places around the world as an athlete and then just as like, you know, a student athlete and stuff like that. What's your, what's your favorite? What's the, what's the most beautiful place that you've run before? Um, this is always a really hard question. And um, I, I struggle between Peru and Argentina. Um, just because uh, Peru is absolutely beautiful. And so is Argentina, but Argentina has the better steak and wine. So um, that that might give them a little bit of an edge. But Peru has amazing seafood. So um one of those two countries. That's that's fantastic. Well, you know, kind of on that, since you brought up food, um, you know, when I'm when I'm out like hiking and backpacking, especially towards the end of the trip, my brain switches into what is the meal that I'm gonna crush when I get back. Um, what do you have a favorite meal that your go-to thing when you get back? Is it like steak and wine or, you know, for me, it's like, I look for a place with like bottomless crab legs and I just destroy, I don't know, a bunch of <laughs> crustaceans. Um, what about you? Um, steak and wine uh, is definitely like a go-to for me. Um, but like a lot of times I end up in places where you can't get that. So it's like, well, I guess I'm going to have a McDonald's cheeseburger. That will do. Um, <laughs> like, it's just, it's really funny. Uh, so like after I did the Ice Age Trail last year, uh, which is about 1200 miles, and I kept saying for like the final four days, I'm like, I cannot wait to have a steak and some wine and a salad because <laughs> I had not I had not had like an actual vegetable in like three weeks at that point. So I'm like, okay, I cannot wait for this. And I finished uh, just late enough in the evening that nothing was open except for this bar that was serving frozen pizzas. And I was like, oh my goodness. Like I have just been out on the trail for three weeks. I've been eating gas station food for three weeks. And now I'm getting frozen pizza as my first meal after completing this thing. It was like, it was almost the perfect ending to this that, you know, no one would have expected. Ah, oh, that's, that's fantastic. It, I, I, I have been there before and crushed some frozen pizzas and they were a delight. Uh, <laughs> um, well, kind of on that, you know, the, the Ice Age Trail, just, whew, what an achievement. Um, do you think, would that... Is that your toughest run? Um, I mean, what do you think, uh, what's the toughest time you've had on a run? We'll just kind of put it out there like that. Um, yeah, I would say Ice Age was definitely the, yeah, yes it was. Um, that was just a lot of unforeseen obstacles. Um, and so because of that, I would say there are a lot of challenges that we had, that we were dealing with because like, um, like physically, that was by far the farthest I'd ever gone in, you know, an attempt to do something. But then at the same time, it's like we were doing this during COVID. So um, some places were open, some places weren't, some campgrounds were open, some were not. Um, and then because I chose to do this in June, um, the ticks and mosquitoes in Wisconsin were the worst like bug conditions that I've ever been in. Um, and like on day two, I came out of the trail and I was only eight miles into day two and came out of the trail with about 40 ticks on me. 
and I was like, I'm done. Take me out of here. Like we, we are absolutely going home. And luckily my crew was able to talk me into going back out there, but like, I was absolutely done with it because I had never had a tick on me before I started the ice age trail, which which is unbelievable to me because it's not like I'm never out in the outdoors, but yet I just never had one. So then to have that many at one point was, it just, it totally threw me off my game for a while. Um, and then like on day five, I rolled my ankle. And so um, I was ahead of record pace on day five and as up by quite a bit actually. Um, and then on day 10, I was down almost 50 miles behind the record pace. Um, and so at that point, I mean, that almost puts me a full day behind. Um, and then I still had to cover 275 miles in less than four days to be able to get the record and somehow I was able to pull that off. Um, and so it's just like so many different things like that were happening, uh, that I would say that like Ice Age is definitely, uh, the hardest I've had to push, um, in terms of just doing the same thing over and over and over. Ah, that's that's just incredible. I, you know, yeah, this, I, I too have experienced ticks like that before. And my goodness, they are just no fun. And I loved reading that, like, I think maybe it was somebody that was following you on the in, online gave you the idea of like duct tape around your ankles to help out with the ticks, which is just genius. Um, and, uh, and for those that, that don't know, so the Ice Age Trail, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, Corey, is a, a 1200 mile trail in Wisconsin. Um, you, uh, successfully completed an FKT attempt. Um, do you want to give us a little bit of background of, of that and what an FKT is and all that jazz? Yeah, so an FKT stands for fastest known time. Um, and like people had been doing them for the past few years. Um, but it kind of over like, especially during COVID, like FKTs really started to take off where um, basically you can go supported, which is you are allowed to have a crew and you can take supplies from other people out on the trail. You can take supplies. Uh, you can get them from stores, gas stations, whatever, um, which is awesome. Otherwise, you have um, self-supported, which means that you could um, basically you could do like you, you could drop supplies for yourself along the trail as you're going. Or if you can get to a gas station or a store, then you can do that. Or you can go unsupported, which means you have to carry everything with you. And the only thing that you can take is water from the land. Um, and so um, I chose to go supported on this because it was my longest effort. And uh, there, I don't really know that self-supported would be a fun way to do the Ice Age Trail, um, to be honest. Um, but yeah, so that's kind of what that is. And so like now uh, there is a website for it and they keep track of the trails like the AT and the PCT and um, Ice Age and Arizona Trail. Um, and it's just really cool to see people getting out and kind of exploring their local areas now um, because an FKT doesn't have to be, you know, a thousand plus miles. It can be something that's 10 miles, but maybe it's, you know, a trail segment that everybody in your area does. And so it's really cool to see people going after these and just watching times just get faster and faster on a lot of things. Yeah, it's it's been really cool seeing this blow up, you know, um, and I totally agree. You know, you don't have to do a big thousand mile trail to knock out an FKT uh, here in Texas just 45 minutes outside of Houston, where I live, we've got the Lone Star Trail, and I'm constantly reading about FKT attempts, uh, on, and that's like 100 miles, you know, and so um, it's it's fun to see people rediscovering the outdoors and maybe getting a little competitive about it, which is kind of neat. Um, do you have any, I mean, so, so in 2012, I through hiked the AT, and then after that, like, I caught the bug, and I was planning my next you know, through hike and whatnot. Did you catch the FKT bug or do you have some grand scheme plans coming up in the future? Um, well, most recently I did uh, the Pinhoti Trail in Georgia and Alabama um, and got the FKT on that back in April, um, which is 350 miles with uh, like 50,000 feet of elevation gain. Like it's just, it's a nasty trail. <laughs> uh, yeah, like that just, whew. But um, I, this fall, I'm going after the Arizona Trail, which is about 800 miles that goes from Utah to Mexico. Um, and then I actually want to do the AT next, uh, next fall. 
Nice. Huh. That, and, and I read you were, uh, are you going to do a southbound attempt on the AT? Yes. Originally, I had planned on going northbound, and then just so many other things happened that now I'm going to go southbound. Nice. Ah, that's fantastic. Wow, that, kudos to you, man. That is that, really great. Um, well, kind of shifting gears a little bit, you know, we've been talking about some kind of higher level stuff, but, you know, what's some advice that you think would be valuable that you would like to give to maybe a beginner runner or somebody looking to advance to like, you know, a next level of running or, you know, ultra marathons or just, you know, their local 5k or something like that. Yeah. Uh, 10 seconds at a time. You can do anything for 10 seconds at a time. Um, if you're just starting out, then great. Keep on going. And if you're, you know, trying to get to the next level, then, um, you know, it's not always going to be a super easy or fun transition, but just stick with it. Um, like personally for me, like I got up to like the 50 mile distance and just had a great, just run with all of that stuff. And then going from 50 miles to a hundred kilometers. So literally 12 miles longer. Um, I have not finished most of the hundred kilometer races I've started. Uh, I think I've only finished two of maybe six at this point, but yeah, I finished every 100 mile race I've been in and I've finished every 50 mile race I've been in. So like, sometimes there is just kind of that weird zone of like, it's, it's, it's hard and you know, you really have to figure it out. Um, but yeah, I always tell people 10 seconds at a time, um, just break things down into small chunks, um, and just keep on going. And especially if you're starting out, like, don't worry about having like the latest gear or the latest clothes or all of that. Like no one's going to make fun of you because you don't have, you know, the most expensive this or that, like, it's more just about being out there and, uh, people are really fun and accepting. Yeah, I've, I've, I've really found that too. And it's, it's kind of nice. And everybody, everybody gets to start somewhere, you know, and we don't have to all start at an elite level. Um, I, I, I loved reading your, your, uh, and hearing about the, your mantra of like 10 seconds at a time, and kind of that you also had something that I did in my head, which was just kind of right foot, left foot, you know, that at the end of the day, if I just right foot, left foot, just keep going, you can just make it through whatever you need to get to, you know, and like, yeah, so important. Is there any, uh, uh, another thing that kind of comes up for me is I'll like, I'll get a, a song stuck in my head on repeat that becomes like, you know, a sort of mantra for the trip. Um, do you ever have any music or song or a specific one that, that kind of pumps you up when you're, uh, uh, out there running? Um, I don't necessarily have a specific song, I'd say, but I listen to a lot of heavy metal and hard rock. Um, so like, that's, uh, that's kind of like my go-to just to get in the zone and get it done. Um, yeah, I don't know. I just, I like all music though. And I like every, like, I, I listen to like a ton of like music podcasts and uh, stuff like that as well. So um, yeah, but nothing necessarily, not a specific one, I should say. Nice. Oh, cool. Well, I mean, when you're running like that, do you have a certain device you use? I mean, for listening to music, like, is it, are you just listening to headphones? Um, and same thing too, when you're tracking yourself, what sort of devices are you using to track that, uh, track your run and listen to music and stuff like that? Yeah. So I use, um, I just use my phone for music. Um, I normally keep it in like airplane mode and, um, I just download a bunch of like songs and playlists and stuff and just kind of listen to it. Um, and then as for like tracking, I have a chorus watch that I use for tracking cause it gets great battery life. I can get usually about 50 hours of battery life out of it. Um, so like during Penhody, for example, it took me 127 hours to finish that trail. Um, and I only charged it twice during like the 127 hours so um that was pretty awesome and then um i also use a spot tracker um just because i like to put that up so other people can you know follow along and um just see if i'm making progress or not <laughs> uh, yeah um and then um i also have um i use the gut hooks app um just because that kind of also works when i don't really have a great signal or anything and so um, those are kind of like the three things that I use. Nice. Oh, that's really cool. Yeah. I use the, the very familiar with gut hooks as well as the spot. You know, I've, I've had instances where I, I stopped getting a signal because I was in like the green tunnel on the AT and 
my parents freaked out or the people at home because they're like, oh no, he hasn't moved for you know six hours. Like, no, I was I was moving. Um, and so yeah, that's that, it's really neat to learn about different people's devices and things like that. Um, well, kind of uh, you know, when you are out there running, and I mean, in some of the images I've seen of you, you're in those sort of like vest packs and stuff, your sort of signature speedo, which is just fantastic. Um, you know, uh, you don't have the ability to carry too much stuff in those packs. So what what do you use to fuel up and what do you carry with you to, you know, keep consuming as you're out there running? Yeah, um, so this is going to be like a two-part question then because like when I'm racing, uh, what I use when I'm racing and like what I use on like a longer FKT or a through hiking, whatever, is completely different. Um, so when I'm racing, I will usually use like, probably depends on the length of the race, I guess, but I'll use like one of the, uh, the North face packs. It's like two liters. Uh, we did just come out with a 12 liter pack, which is great for some of these races that have like a big mandatory gear list. Um, but I like our two liter because you can still carry about a liter of water with you. Um, and then like any of the other supplies that you may need until you get to the next aid station. So um, right now I'm using UCAN as like a great source of carbs because um, like I've, I've gone through quite a few different nutrition styles um, and I found that I just really like the carbs that they're, that are in UCAN. Um, they're just super easy on my stomach. Um, and I've also found that it, I can just put like one concentrated flask of UCAN with all the calories I need for say a hundred mile race. And then that way I don't have to keep on switching things out. I just know that I always have them. So I really like that. Um, I'm not a huge fan of like gels or anything like that, just because they're usually pretty sugary. Um, and it's like when you're out there for say 24 hours for a hundred mile race, you kind of get tired of that sugar. Um, <laughs> And so especially like if you're doing something that's multiple days, like that's kind of hard. Um, I actually just signed a deal with uh, Kodiak. So um, now you're going to see me eating a lot more um, pancakes and um, they're making granola bars right now or well, Kodiak bars. Um, and I've been testing out a bunch of those and I am a huge fan of that as well. Um, and so I'm really excited for um, like the next FKT type thing because uh, I can't wait to make a bunch of pancakes and uh, eat all of the bars. Um, but yeah, so for like a longer through hike type thing, um, my nutri my normal nutrition kind of goes out of the window and, um, I start using a lot of other things such as, um, uh, McDonald's breakfast burritos, hash browns, um, you know, chicken sandwiches, cheeseburgers, uh, SpaghettiOs straight out of the can, um, chicken and stars soup straight out of the can because you get your carbs, you get your sodium, um, just like things like that. And it's funny because to figure out if this stuff actually worked for me or not, I just went to the store and bought a bunch of different cans of soup and SpaghettiOs and stuff and ate them cold. And it's <laughs> like, does this upset my stomach or does this not? And so that's how I figured out like five different foods that would work. Um, because I always say, if you're going to do something really long like that, you should always have five different foods that you know you can always eat that won't upset your stomach. And no matter what happens out there, you can still take in those calories. Um, another trick I have is like mashed potatoes and mix it with either vegetable broth or chicken broth. And that's a great source of fuel as well. Um, and so on something like that, I would probably go with the 12 liter pack just because you don't really know how long it is be between seeing crew. Um, and I can do that for about, I mean, I can do that for probably about six hours. Um, anything over that, then I'm probably carrying an 18 to 22 liter pack. Um, but you can also take that 18 to 22 liter pack on say a two day backpacking trip if you pack light. Yeah, no, for sure. And that's, that's great advice. I mean, you know, you, you need to, to, pick your fuel for your activity um, and making sure you're going to like it is oftentimes you'll see people out there and they've never tried their food before and you know it's not a good time <laughs> and just so everybody knows um, you know 
uh, uh, McDonald's and fast food, like, you know, sandwiches and whatnot, uh, it, it keeps really, really well. And so it's kind of a, a long distance hiker trip to, you know, if you, there's a, on the PCT, there's a famous McDonald's that's like on the trail and folks will like do a resupply at the McDonald's and carry that for the next three days. So it's good stuff. Um, yeah, it keeps probably a little bit too well, which is, <laughs> which is the funny part. <laughs> um, there, yeah, like, I just, I laugh about that, because uh, on Pinhody, there's one point where um, I was just telling my crew, I'm like, I'm really cold, like, I'm kind of low on energy right now, and they're like, well, we'll get you McDonald's, and I was like, okay, but I'm like, what are we going to do for, like, the next two days, and they're like, don't worry about it, and so, <laughs> so sure enough, they went out and bought, like, 25 cheeseburgers, and, like, two days later, they're still handing me the same cheeseburgers, and I'm like, we haven't passed to McDonald's, and they're like, once again, don't worry about it. But yeah, I mean, it works. Ah, oh, that's a great crew you got right there. <laughs> oh, yeah. And also, you know, on Kodiak Cakes, I listened to their, uh, the, the How I Built This on by Guy Raz, you know, uh, about the, like, formation of that company, and they've got a really, really cool story. I've got, got some of their pancake mix in my kitchen, so that's very cool. <laughs> oh, um, yeah. Well, kind of like, you know, on, on in regards to like, you know, your sponsors and the folks you're affiliated, I mean, how did your relationship with North Face get started? Um, yeah, so that is a fun story um, mm -hmm. because uh, there is a magazine that wanted to do a story on like, what's it like being a black and gay trail runner? Mm -hmm. And I was like, this article has already been done before. Like, why are we talking about this right now? What I really want to talk about is the lack of sponsorship for high level athletes in the Midwest. And they're just like, wow, we never thought about that. Okay. They're like, now you're just going to hijack our story and turn it into your own, but that's fine. You can do this. And so like, we had a big conversation about this. And um, so the article comes out and um, the athlete coordinator for the North Face reached out to me like the day the article came out or whatever. And she sent me an inbox message on like Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Mm -hmm. And I just didn't believe it was actually the North Face. So uh, I just deleted it. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so then I didn't respond for like, well, obviously since I deleted it, I couldn't respond. So then like two days mm -hmm. went by and she inboxes me again and she's like hey like this is real and he's like sorry so I'm like okay if this is real like please call me on this day at this time and they did <laughs> so I was like oh okay like here we are let's talk um and so we talked for a while and then I signed with them uh I guess this is my what third year on the team so yeah but that was just a really funny like introduction to me being on the team. <laughs> That's so great from doing the interview and then just being hyper suspicious, like, nope, no, nope, this can't be real. <laughs> That's, That's fantastic. <laughs> um, well, uh, you know, one of the new products that North Face has come out with uh, is the, the North Face Vective. Um, and, you know, at, at Whole Earth, we're carrying the Vective line of like footwear and whatnot. Um, tell us a little bit about it, you know, a little bit about technology and why, why you like it. Yeah, so I have been, I mean, I was one of the original people to kind of test the shoe. Um, well, I guess most of our athlete team was, um, but now we're on our, like, I guess it'd be my fourth version of the shoe. And, um, and it's awesome. Like it's, it's the North Face hasn't really been known for uh, running footwear, um, like, Ever. Um, and I am just super pumped that I think we are kind of changing the game of this footwear. Um, and so our, we have three different models, but the Vective is like the top line. And the Vective actually has a carbon plate in it, which is different than most trail running shoes out there. And um, I love that in the, in the sense that like the carbon plate, uh, it just, it makes you feel like you're going fast but it also kind of acts like a rock plate, kind of a little bit of protection from, you know, the little rocks that may pop up and all that stuff. Um, so right now they also have the same like rocker technology in the hiking boots as well. Um, and I've used those for multiple like overnight backpacking trips and uh, Pinhody 
Um, so yeah, like I love the hiking shoes. I love the running shoes. And we currently have a really fun design. There's like the Western States trail version of it just came out. And that is like by far my favorite shoe that the North Face has ever done. And uh, yeah, it's just, it's light, it's fast, it's awesome. Um, if you go to the mid, if you go to the mid model, um, then that is a really cool shoe because it actually has some of the future light technology in it, which is um, basically a Gore-Tex type material that is breathable and it's waterproof, water resistant. Um, so really fun. And then the lowest model is the Endurus, um, which is like, that's just my daily trainer. Um, that's a shoe that has the most cushioning in it. Um, it's durable and you can use it on all types of trains. That's, that's super, you know, it, it's so funny The when we got these shoes in, we're like, what is this? Uh, and once we all like put them on our feet, you, once you kind of wear it, you kind of immediately are like, oh, this is totally different. I, I am intrigued. Uh, it's really, really cool stuff. And I love seeing that technology um, going into the, the shoes and that, you know, that folks like you that are actually out there doing it were able to put in like real feedback into, you know, um, that kind of stuff is all really, really cool. Um, so, you know, with the types of runs and stuff that you do, how many pairs of shoes are you going through a year? I mean, <laughs> um, yeah, it's kind of disgusting, actually. <laughs> um, so on the Ice Age trail, we'll just talk about Ice Age. Um, I used 13 different pairs of shoes in 21 days of Ice Age just because everything was so wet that I was like, I can't afford to have blisters on this. So I went through 13 pairs of shoes and I think we were like 25 pairs of socks or something like that. But to be fair, I didn't get a blister until seven miles to go. So, um, you know, it worked. But honestly, it's like, I probably go through, oh, I probably go through 15 to 20 pairs of shoes uh, a year. Um, and that's just between road running, trail running, these longer FKTs. Um, cause I like to rotate my shoes out. So I normally have like three different pairs or so in rotation at all times. So I just don't have to run day to day in the same shoe and it kind of helps prolong the life of it. But then when you're doing something, you know, like an FKT, all of a sudden it's like, you just put 50 miles in one day on that pair of shoes. And then it's just like, oh, things start breaking down a bit quicker. Um, but 15 to 20 is probably a normal year for me. That's Herculean. That's so awesome. <laughs> um, you know, talking about switching out your shoes so much and, uh, and your socks on the FKT, you know, I mean, uh, on the, the Ice Age, sorry. Um, you know, what, do you have a favorite pair of socks? Do you like thin socks or thicker cushion socks, wool, synthetic? Um, what kind of, so, I mean, socks are always a huge choice for people starting off as well as people that are out there and can really sort of make or break, you know, your feet are gonna what, gonna be what allows you to get an FKT or just make it out of the wilderness. Um, so yeah, what, what's, what's your favorite type of sock or, you know, um, style of sock? Yes, I, I love smart wool socks. Um, and so I normally go with, um, I guess it depends on what exactly I'm doing. So like the smart wool run line is really awesome. And I use that for a lot of like shorter races and um, just like daily running. Um, but I'm actually a huge fan of like the cushioned hiking socks for say like a hundred mile race and then these longer FKTs. Um, and it's funny because I've always been just a fan of, you know, like more cushioning in the sock rather than necessarily more cushioning in the shoe. Um, and so like right now I'm like in a really happy place with cushioning in my socks and cushioning in our shoes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm right there with you. I like to have a, a cushion sock. I know a lot of folks like the ultra light stuff, and, you know, it dries up really, really quickly, but you know, um, yeah, no, I'm, I'm right there with you. Um, you know, like I sort of mentioned earlier in a lot of the images I've seen, you know, you're, you're often running in your, in your Speedo. I saw one where you're like in the Speedo and like halter top. Um, 
Sometimes I think I've seen you rock like sun sleeves and whatnot. Do you have a favorite piece of clothing that you like to wear um, <laughs> when you're out there doing stuff? Come on, Devin. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, I guess it depends on the weather, but when I'm racing, it's always the Speedo. Um, I love it. Uh, that's kind of like, hey, I'm here to race today rather than, oh, I'm just here like training or whatever. Um, so I love to race in that. Um, I don't know. I mean, I've recently started using uh, the North Face actually has like this future light jacket that came out a few years ago. And now we're like, I think we're three years into it. And the newest model that came out is like one of my favorite pieces of clothing because like it, it's great for rain, but it's also amazing in wind. And so like that is one of my favorite things. And because it has taped seams rather than sewn seams, it also uh, doubles as some of our mandatory gear that we need for some of these mountain races. And so I think that's like, for us, that's really important just having, um, just having, you know, a piece of gear that can double as multiple things. Yeah, that future, I'm, you know, I'm, <clears throat> I think one of the common adage for a lot of hikers and folks that go out in the back country is, you know, if you're going to carry something on your back, it has to do at least two things, you know, and uh, <laughs> sorry, let me just get this guy here. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, no, that future light stuff. I mean, I love that it's got like a little bit of a stretch to it as well. Uh, it's really comfy to wear next to skin. Um, so yeah, no, that's, that's really cool. Um, <clears throat> Let's see, to, to, when uh, we've been talking a lot about your kind of like, you know, outdoors and stuff like that, but you know, on a personal note and in learning about you, you are married to a professional skydiver? What I is am. that like? That is, the, I mean, you must be like, when y'all go to like events, you must be the couple with just the coolest stories of everyone. Um, yeah, tell us a little bit about, uh, do you skydive also? Uh, I do not skydive. <laughs> uh, not that I wouldn't, I just don't. And uh, yeah, it's fun. He's, uh, he's really good at falling down. Uh, <laughs> so, so yeah. Uh, yeah, that's, it's pretty wild because he was skydiving before I knew him. So, um, like, to me, it's just normal. I'm like, oh, yeah, he skydives. Like, that's what he does. That's really cool. Well, I mean, and he's also been part of the support crew for you for uh, uh, most of your, your trips. Is that correct also? Yeah. Yep. That's really cool. I mean, you know, to, to have a partner like that, uh, you know, that's a real special thing. So yeah, that's, that's really, really neat. Um, you know, you, a lot of articles and whatnot, you know, focus in on, you know, you being, let's face it, a lot of people in the backcountry and stuff like that, they often look like me, like long haired white guys, you know? Um, and a lot of the articles about you are about, you know, um, you know, uh, you being a gay and black ultra runner out here in this like most dominated scene. Um, you know, what, what's the mark though that you would like to really leave on the running world and kind of in this fight for inclusivity. Um, so yeah, really open up the outdoors to folks of all stripes. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's it really. I mean, um, it's like when I came into the sport, like at the higher level, I guess, like I couldn't think of another like black professional ultra runner that was out there. Um, and I couldn't think of any that were openly gay either. And so it's one of those things where it's like, I don't know how I got my foot in the door, but I just kept fighting for it because it's <laughs> like, I'm here, I'm going to be here and I'm going to do this. And so like, that's one thing it's like, if I can just leave the mark of like, Hey, I fought to help make change. Then, you know, I'm good with that. I think that's, that's something to really, you know, uh, admire. And I think that's, that's really, really great. Not only are the, the, just the <laughs> superhuman feats that you are accomplishing, but also, um, yeah, having that as a goal. And if, if you get one kid out there that wouldn't have been out there, I think that's a, a huge achievement. Um, Absolutely. So, you know, on that, do you have any like L LGBTQIA events coming up or that you are, um, anything coming up for like Pride Month or anything like that? 
Yeah. Um, so we would love to be able to do more, but it's still COVID times and things yeah. are have been really hard to plan. Um, but the good news is I'm actually going to New York City for Pride this year and I'm doing the Pride run there. So I'm really excited for that. Um, so like that's the kind of the big fun thing for June. Nice. Oh, that's really, really cool. Um, well, I mean, so after that, I mean, you know, you've got your <laughs> Appalachian Trail attempt, you've got, you know, your June plan. I mean, do you have any grand plans for the next year? Or, you know, I think one thing that COVID has taught us is just take it one day at a time. Are you just kind of, you know, seeing what comes as the world sort of opens back up? Um, yeah, so I am running uh, High Lonesome 100 in Colorado at the end of July, um, which should be really fun. And then I'm also working at a trail running camp in Guatemala and one in Mexico um, later this fall. And in between those two camps, I am doing the Arizona Trail. Um, so I'm pretty excited for all of that. And then hopefully a decently quiet winter. Um, and then going back to Cocodona 250 next May in Arizona, and then the AT next fall. So um, I've had to start planning these things out. And normally I don't like to make big plans like this ahead of time. I normally like to keep it, you know, um, at least pretty close. But like right now, it's like I have to make these plans and just go for it. Yeah. Uh, that's. You, you've got a full plate. That is super, super cool. Um, you know, kind of going back to uh, the Ice Age Trail and whatnot, when you were doing that, you were raising money for Feeding America, correct? Yes. Yeah. And so, um, by the way, you had a $50,000 goal. How, how, how's that going? Um, I think we raised like thirty five dollars or 36000 um so super super happy about that um yeah just it was it was really awesome to have um just all of the people donate so thank you to everyone that did yeah that's that's huge well no thank you for helping making that happen um you know coming up do you have any do you do you support any running programs or scholarships that benefit the lgbtqia community or you know, any, any scholarships or anything you'd like to shout out the, the camps that you're working at or anything like that? Uh, so the camps are actually more just like focused on everybody in general. Um, mm -hmm. I do have a couple projects coming up with the North Face. I just can't like publicly say them yet. But, <laughs> uh, yeah, but we have a couple things coming up. So uh, stay tuned for those. Yeah. Nice. Um, well, you know, well, cool. Well, it's sort of like, I've got some some sort of like personal questions that sort of like kind of came up because we ran through our pre-scripted questions, which is fantastic. Um, uh, what was the what was the thing that I came? Oh yes, here's a question for me. So when I hike, I often hike in a kilt um, because I learned that chafing is a real thing. Um, <laughs> that kilt life helps me out a lot you know, being, uh, having your legs totally exposed in like a Speedo and stuff like that. Do you ever have problems with chafing? And is that, a, do you have any strategies for that? Um, well, I'm on hashtag team no thigh gap. So, <laughs> um, so there's plenty of rubbing that goes on, but I use uh, squirrel's nut butter. Um, and by using that, like I'm, I really don't chafe. Nice. Yeah, I, 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 I discovered a, a, for myself body glide. And, you know, yeah, I feel like being super on point about applying that before chafing uh, oh, yeah. is, is huge. Um, oh, yeah. Much like the socks, you know, you get the right socks and the right footwear and you can prevent blisters. But, you know, if you have an injury that comes up, you have to deal with it's, it's tough. Um, you know, speaking of that, you're, you had a, uh, 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 ankle strain, I believe you were mentioning on your FKT. What sort of strategies do you use when you're doing something like that to, you know, maintain wellness, um, especially while recovering from an injury while you're still out there on the trail? Um, yeah, that's a great question. And um, honestly, it was like for the ankle, um, 
instead of like trying to do any running or anything, I was just using trekking poles and was walking um, and was stopping to ice things anytime I could. Um, and we wrapped it with, you know, athletic tape. But other than that, there wasn't a lot that I could do because um, the swelling just kept coming. So it's like I could either take one day and uh, basically, you know, um, not do anything and hope that things could help. Um, but I was just like, you know, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna take a zero day because I just didn't have it at that point. Um, so, uh, the other thing that I'd do is like, anytime I was sitting down, I'd always elevate my ankle, just trying to like get some of the swelling out of there. Um, and I, I was lucky enough to be pretty close to a sports chiropractor, um, out on the ice age trail, like in the area that I was hurt. So it was like, okay, I took a short day, went and saw him that day, and then saw him again the next morning before I started again. And that honestly really helped. Um, but then it's like during Pinhoti, like I sprained my wrist when I uh, just about fell at Pinhoti and I stopped myself from falling with my trekking pole, but that's like what ended up spraining my wrist. And uh, for that, we just taped it up and then finally got a brace on it and just kept on going. Um, so I don't use, um, I don't use like Advil or Tylenol or anything like that when I'm out there. Um, and so, uh, I do, I'll have a beer after I cover 50 K or 31 miles for the day. And I use that as like my, you know, natural painkiller. <laughs> well, that's a great one. Um, that's, that's just, whew, I can't can't imagine that like, going through that. You know, I don't know if you can see on my name, I've got Thunderfoot as, in quotations. Um, I got that as a trail name because I developed an injury and my foot would fill up with fluid during the night, you know, and so I would wake up in the morning and one foot would be three times the size of the other one. Um, and I used several strategies similar to that. I, for me, this sort of game changer was a, a, a graduated compression socks when I slept, you know, and yep. it, it, it uh, it was huge for recovery and endurance for me. Um, so I'm always interested in other people's strategies. You were talking about using trekking poles. Are there any, um, do you often use trekking poles on these long trails? Um, do you, do you use them on your, your runs or, um, yeah. Um, I love trekking poles. So I love them for racing, longer efforts, all of it. Um, I use the black diamond carbon Z trekking poles and like, I just, I love it. And before I had never used them, um, until like I rolled my ankle at, uh, on, uh, ice age. And then, um, I realized, oh, like I'm actually faster uphill using trekking poles. And so that was when I started using them and now I use them for like, I train with them. I race with them. Um, I just really like them. Uh, I'm right there with you. I love trekking. I always kind of joke with folks when they're like suspicious about them. I'm like, when's the last time you saw like a horse slip on a banana? Never. All right. Because four legs, they've got four points of contact trekking poles. And so, yeah, that's, that's really, really neat. Yeah. Um, let's see. Speaking of that, I mentioned my trail name. Do you have a trail name? You've done enough long trails. Um, or do you just go by Corey, the awesome one. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, so this is hilarious. Um, after Ice Age, uh, people started calling me the Ice Queen. So um, that is apparently my trail name now. Uh, I love it. You don't, you know, you never get to pick a trail name. It just, it just becomes, and then yeah, you just kind of embrace it. That's a fantastic one. I love it. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> We are going to open up for some questions and answers for other folks. I've seen people have been putting stuff out on the chat. Um, we've got a question. <clears throat> what are some challenges or experiences you've had, in, uh, had professionally in building your personal brand? Yeah. Um, so starting out, uh, one of the like bigger challenges was honestly like living in the Midwest and not necessarily racing some of the higher profile races that sponsors were kind of looking at. So I had a lot of great results and I had a lot of like really fast times, but they just weren't at races that some sponsors thought were necessarily the most competitive or they had like never even heard of the race. 
So like that was one thing, but I was like, you know, if I live in Illinois, it's not necessarily possible for me to fly out to California every other weekend and race, or, you know, I can't just be like, Hey, let's go race UTMB in Europe. And now we're going to spend $6,000 on this trip out of pocket with no sponsors and stuff, which I get that people do that. But my goal is like, I want to do this professionally, but I also is like, I have to like be reasonable. Um, so like that was one of them. And then another thing is like, I didn't come out for quite a while. Um, like I didn't come out until I was 25, almost 26. And part of that was just because I had no idea if sponsors would like approve of me being gay or if they'd like turn them off. And so um, there is a lot of just like wanting to be known for my athletic ability without there being other things involved. So like that's uh like those are like two of the big things that kind of started out, um, and then since then, um, it's like, hmm, I don't know. I'd say since then it's been more just, um, like people like I I did well in my first hundred mile race and then I did well at Western States and so people just kind of thought like oh well you're a hundred mile specialist now um and for me as like I I didn't know that I was ready to actually go up and actually want to be a hundred mile specialist and then I just kind of skipped right over that and went into the longer stuff (laughs) (laughs) oh I love it uh well, that's great. I mean, yeah, those those are some real legit challenges, and and it's really uh, your story is really powerful and, and just you know inspiring. To, you know the way that you come about. So yeah, that's I'm I'm impressed. <laughs> um, Emery, I'm gonna butt in real quick. We got a message through or a question through direct message, um, just kind of asking Corey. So if uh, for a runner who's only done like road or smooth trails. How would you recommend they go about altering their training goal times for those rougher trail runs, like their minute per mile, or would you go more towards like a target heart rate versus like a, t- a timed goal? Um, that is a great question. And honestly, it's, I mean, I don't know that you can necessarily even think about a certain pace per mile on some of these rougher trails because you could be even like you know east coast to west coast like rough trails on the west coast still aren't going to necessarily compare to like some of the rough trails on like the AT. so i would say that honestly it's more just perceived effort um what you think your effort should be for um how long you're going to be out there than kind of like uh, I mean, I, I don't even pay attention to heart rate on the trail anymore. I'm like, I feel like I could do this for X amount of miles, or I feel like I could do this for X amount of hours. Um, and that's kind of how I just judge my effort. Um, and just in general, I like to um, hike the ups and, you know, run the flats and downs. Um, so I think that that's more of a way to do it, just on what you feel like your effort should be rather than, you know, watching your watch. Awesome. Yeah, no, that's, that's, that's great advice. Um, let's see. The, we've got another great question. Uh, <laughs> um, and I was actually thinking about this too, because I read about your FKT and you pulled a couple all nighters. It's like 30 something hours of hiking and whatnot. Um, and so what kind of surprise challenges or encounters with wild animals have you maybe experienced or challenging weather um, that have really tested you during these races and, uh, and long trails and stuff like that? And to what extent do you think people should prepare for extreme situations like those? Yes, um, this uh, brings me back to like Ultra Trail Mount Fuji. Um, so it's a 106 mile race that basically circumnavigates Mount Fuji. And um, the weather there, you just never know what it's going to be. And so I ended up going on the blizzard year, which um, is 
was rough. Um, but basically for that race, you have 18 mandatory items that you must start the race with. So it has like emergency blankets. Um, you have to carry a flare with you, I think. Um, you have to have, you know, X amount of calories. Once you leave an aid station, you have to be able to carry a certain amount of water. Um, you have to have like a, a base layer. You have to have a sealed, um, um, a sealed seam, you know, outer layer, like all these different things. And before the race, I was just like, why do we need to carry 18 things with us? Cause I'm like, now I'm carrying like a nine liter pack or something like that. I'm like, there's no way I could possibly use every item in this pack. Like it's, I mean, it seemed like it was just like way too much. Well, turns out here I am 27 hours into the race in a blizzard on top of a mountain and I used every single item that was in that pack except for <laughs> my emergency food and my emergency water. Um, so I would say that when you're going out on these longer efforts, you always need to be prepared, um, you know, to have extra water or a way to filter water, um, extra calories. And like, I like to carry at least six hours of extra calories, but honestly, it's like, I'll carry enough that I could survive for another 12 hours or so. Um, and then from that, like, even if you don't think you're going to be out after dark, you should always have some sort of warm layer with you. Um, honestly, a rain layer or a wind layer isn't a bad idea. Um, like, I honestly believe that's better to slightly overpack than to even be like, just, uh, just even a little bit underpacked. Um, but yeah, and at the same time, it's also like, it, you need to know the terrain and the environment that you're going into. And so it's always great to do a lot of research on that ahead of time. Um, and also, you know, what, what's the closest, you know, contact point that you can go from a trail to say a road to be able to get into a town or someone be able to get in to get you. Like there's a lot that you kind of have to think about for these longer efforts and some of these even hard races. Um, but like, yeah, in Japan, that was that was a surprise um wasn't expecting that because it was 55 and sunny the whole week leading into it so there's that um animal encounters haven't really had too many animal encounters um on ice age uh, i got hit in the shin with it from a baby deer that i startled like waking up from a nap i was just like oh, like wasn't expecting that um and then I've run into a few bears at times, but like they, the bears haven't been scary. I mean, they're more scared of us than we are of them. Um, but yeah, weather, weather is definitely the one thing that you kind of always have to be prepared for. Yeah, agreed. And that's all really great advice. You know, uh, uh, it's um, best laid plans, you know, they can totally fall apart. And, uh, you know, you, you may not plan on being there overnight, but being being ready for that uh, is is huge. Um, I'm just curious on your overnight ones. Were you just like so exhausted that you just didn't notice, or was there? Did you have any like creep out moments where I, I don't know? Sometimes when I'm hiking and doing night hikes and stuff like that, I'll just I just get creeped out because I'm by myself and I'll start singing or something like that to just kind of like psych myself back up. Do you, do you ever have any of that or you just moving so fast you don't even feel it? Um, I love the nighttime. So for me, it's not really freaky for me and like running into animals and stuff. Like if, I mean, half the time I probably don't even notice them because <laughs> um, I like to keep my headlamp just bright enough that I can see the trail and like see like what's in front of me, but I really don't always want to look around. Um, and so, um, oh, another one. When I was on the Arizona trail, like doing a two day fast pack on that, uh, this is one moment that I was not prepared for. Mm -hmm. um, so you also have to pay attention to altitude because um, just as you know, as we go up, it gets cooler. Um, and sometimes there's still snow on like the backside of the mountain that you're not really expecting. Um, and so that is one where I had my headlamp on and I knew that we were going up into the Superstition Mountains and I was like, oh, this is fine. This is all good. And the next thing you know, we're out there in like a probably a one foot wide ledge, but there's still snow on it. And we didn't have ice spikes with us um, or like any type of crampons or anything like that. And I was like, I just came up on the first like snow spot um, with my headlamp and I was like, oh, this is not good. And so it's one of those where it's like, 
do we pass this and try to keep on going? But if we do, then there's a possibility that, you know, one of us could slide down the hill or do we turn around and hike like 55 miles back out when we were only like 40 miles from the, the car that we placed up ahead? So it was like, we had to make a decision there. Um, and luckily we had trekking poles with us and it just, we felt confident enough that like the ice wasn't going to break away or anything that we could pass it. But like, that's another thing, like early spring and like early fall, um, hikes, like you always need to be prepared for weather. Yeah. Ah, that's, that's a gnarly scenario. Well, I'm glad you came out of that. Okay. Um, <laughs> and you have the great story to tell now. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, um, let's see, you got some more questions from folks. Uh, let's see. So your North Face athlete, somebody has a specific question about the North Face, the Vective Endurance. Um, how many miles do you think you can put on one of those before you, uh, you ended up, ended up replacing it? Um, I would say it depends on the type of trail that you are on, but in general, like I would, I don't know, like, I don't like to put more than 400 miles on any pair of shoes. Um, and I would say that like, you could, you would be, you would be able to get 400 miles out of that. I think, I think that's a fair sentiment. I mean, I think, you know, all shoes are going to be different, but yeah, that's, that's a good, that's a good expectation to, to have, um, I have another question via direct message over here. Um, just asking about your relationship with the other North Face athletes. Like how do you interact and about how often would you interact with other North Face athletes? Yeah, um, that is a great question. And uh, the first year I was on the team, it was pretty fun because uh, we were all able to like travel and uh, race together and do these different things. And then my second year was COVID. And so um, I think we raced up until like March 7th. So I met um, at that time we had, I think 16 runners on the team and I met four or three of them um, at um, a race out in California in early March. And then it's like, as we were all flying home, like the world basically shut down. And <laughs> so because of that, um, it was like, oh, okay, well, you know, hopefully this will blow over in a little bit and I'll see you guys all at, you know, uh, we're, we are, we, most of the team was going to go to a race in April. So like it, we probably have had 12 of us there. Um, and then it's like, nope, that's not happening. That's not happening. And, uh, the next thing, you know, uh, I went, I think 14 months without seeing, um, another teammate of mine. Um, which is just pretty wild. Um, and even the people that lived in like our couple athletes that live in Boulder and the couple that live in Flagstaff and stuff like so many people were just staying home and not like running with other people um, that that was pretty hard. Um, but now um, we actually just had like a little run team gathering um, a week ago or so and that was awesome like i got to meet uh, all of the new runners that were on the team um and just like it was really nice to see a bunch of people and um hang out with them and get to know them it's it's so great seeing people now <laughs> yes uh, uh just uh, i'm you know we're slowly getting there the world's coming back and yeah i'm, I'm super stoked for it heather you had the the do you have any BIPOC or LGBTQIA role models that give you inspiration to keep running or going on in your endeavors? Yeah. Um, so honestly, it, it, it was kind of funny because um, just in the outdoor space, um, I really didn't know of many just either, you know, LGBTQ plus people or uh, people of color that were doing this. And so for the longest time, I really just didn't have that role model or anything. And now it's like, um, so many people have been coming out and sharing their stories over the last few years that there's a lot, um, Addie Bracey, I mean, she's awesome. I believe she's a Nike athlete right now. Um, and I mean, she's, you know, Olympic trials qualifier in the steeplechase, Olympic trials qualifier in the marathon. Um, now she's into trail running and she's just like, she literally wins like everything she does. Um, so she's super awesome. Um, and then just like, 
yeah, like, I don't know, there, there's actually a lot, I guess. Um, but it's just, it's nice to see more athletes are finally getting out there. Um, and, you know, they're open about it. That's, that's really cool. It, it is, it is really just great seeing more and more people get out there and more and more people out there that, that other people can identify and, and see that reflect themselves. Um, it's a, it's a special time to be, to be alive and out in the adventure world. Um, we've got one more question aside from running, um, you know, what other challenges engage interest and inspire you? Um, do you approach these other challenges in the same way you do with running? Yeah. So, um, I also enjoy, um, adventure racing. So I was actually on, uh, the Amazon show, uh, the world's toughest race eco challenge Fiji. Um, and so that was fun because I had, you know, a little bit of the skills for this, but all of a sudden it's like, wow, now I really need to make sure that I'm proficient on ropes and have no problem, you know, going up and down waterfalls and everything with, you know, a weighted pack or maybe a bike attached to that pack. Um, and same thing, like you had to know how to sail, you had to know how to stand up paddleboard and mountain bike. And so um, that was all really fun. And um, I will hopefully be racing again uh, soon. But like, that's one of those things where if I'm training for something like that, then I basically put running on the back burner and put all my energy into those sports just because uh, I want to be as good as those as I am at running. And when you're doing that, you also do that with a team. So it's like, you don't want to let one of your teammates down by being like, oh, like I thought I knew how to do this, but I actually don't. Yeah. No, you, you, you don't want to be that one <laughs> that's slowing everybody else down. Uh, well, I think we're kind of rounding out the, the end of our time. Rainy and Heather, thank you so much for helping put this together. Um, oh, thank you guys. This was excellent. So fun. Yeah. <laughs> Corey, thank you so much for your time. There was a lot of great stuff there. I have lightly dabbled in running a few times. And so I think hearing hearing even you say like, just get out there for 30 minutes. Like if that's what you can do, like, just do it. Just go do something is something that I need to hear on a very regular basis. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. And it was a pleasure meeting you, Corey. I'm also part of the LGBTQ, sorry, LGBTQIA <laughs> plus community. So it's always wonderful seeing more role models in the space in anything outdoors. It's always nice to see more representation. So um, we're really thankful that you're here today and uh, we had a great time. So thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Be on the lookout for more events from Whole Earth. You can follow us on social media at Whole Earth Prov. You can also follow Corey. Uh, Corey, if you want, feel free to shout out any of your handles or any anywhere that uh, anybody can find out more info about you. Yeah, I'm just at Corey Woltering on Instagram. I've been Emery, the the little, little guy you've heard barking has been Salvador Dogley. I'm very sorry about that. And uh, <laughs> Corey, it's been really just a pleasure talking with you and getting a chance to meet you. And I, I look forward to following you in your future endeavors. Yeah, thank you. This has been really fun. <laughs>